the Samoan culture is centered on respect for one another. And out of that respect, you express your love and support of one another. The culture itself, in its most basic, is taking care of one another within your village so that all families get along, you know, without being asked. Uh, when something happens to one family, everybody gravitates to that family to lend assistance with no hesitation and without being asked to come and help. That's the way we lived. As I watched the videos when I arrived uh, back into the island, because when it happened, I was in Honolulu. So the following morning I arrived uh, on a Coast Guard plane. And when I watched the videos, I saw characteristics of that all over, that people stopped and helped clean up helped a family, helped someone who was needing assistance. And as I toured the island that morning I arrived, I saw that in just about every village that was stricken. I saw people among us from other villages that were there working to clear up the debris. I saw people from other villages helping to look for people that were still missing. So I, I think, you know, that's basically, you know, the kind of thing I'm talking about that makes, I, I think other cultures do that too, but we do this as a way of living. I honestly believe that the true economic opportunities of American Samoa will come with a determination on what our political status will eventually be. Uh, but that's a very huge and major discussion, so I'll come back to that later. Before the tsunami, we had already been served notice that uh, Chicken of the Sea, Samoa Packing, would be leaving on September 30th of 2009. It would be closing its doors forever. So I was already out looking for a replacement the reason why I concentrated those initial efforts to fisheries was because this is the product we have around us, fish. We do not have gold, we do not have timber, we do not have other nickel or uh, anything else. We have fish. So it makes sense that we continue to uh, embrace fisheries as our major industries, at least for now. And so I was already looking for a cannery to take over, you know, the uh, uh, soon-to-be-closed uh, facilities. One of the reasons that I decided to do that, the second reason for deciding to do that was to retrofit that facility to a different industry would have been too expensive and would be prohibitive. So it would prevent other industries from even considering it. So. Uh, the effort was to you know, try and find a replacement cannery. The third reason is that we already have a fishing industry in development and for that to go away and cut the exports in half would necessarily mean somewhere along the line the fisheries would close as well or many of them might lose their boats or things like that. And fourth most of the businesses and the service industry around the territory was centered around services to the canneries. All the way from legal services to ship channeling, it was all centered around uh, the, the, the canneries. So much so that 80% of our economy was dependent or reliant on the, on the canneries. So it makes sense that we continue along that track. But the one statistic that not too many people uh, knew about was our workforce was still 70% of the workforce was just a high school degree or less. So the jobs that require much higher training would not receive a whole lot of support from, from the territory. And that was uh, all the considerations 
uh, that got me to move towards finding another cannery. It took a little while longer because after the tsunami we had to redirect our efforts that way in the recovery effort. So we had to come back to the uh, search for you know, suitable companies. And then I also had to redirect some efforts in sustaining the remaining cannery. We couldn't just very well put all our efforts in searching for a new company and abandon you know, the very thing that we have in our, in our hands. So we couldn't very well walk away from that. So we spent a little time trying to make sure that the remaining cannery is stabilized, that we do all that we can to preserve the jobs. Mind you that uh, we just lost 1,600 jobs, you know, the day after the tsunami. Of course, uh, Samo Packing Chicken of the Sea was gracious enough to keep about 100 jobs as a workforce to help with the recovery efforts. <coughs> and they were out there helping as uh, they paid their salaries, uh, maintained uh, employment for those few people, and they went out to the villages, helped the villages with their cleanup and recovery efforts. So I was very appreciative of that effort by Chicken of the Sea. But 45, 50 days later, they just could not carry the payroll anymore and finally closed the doors and dismissed all that was left. So uh, all that was good, and in the middle of all the recovery, we uh, started back on looking for a substitute cannery. Fortunately for us, we, uh, uh, through the efforts of a gentleman named Carlos Sanchez, I was introduced to the owners of Trimarine, which, is, which I've come to learn is a very financially stable, strong, uh, multinational company. So they're here. Uh, they've taken over that uh, facility. Uh, they've started the recovery. They are rebuilding. Uh, they have already started uh, shipping out uh, fresh frozen fish to other markets. It's not as much as according to what they tell me and they will continue to improve and they are also working on their cold storage and redevelopment of the cannery. So we see the jobs coming. It may not be tomorrow, it may not be next month, but we see this recovery you know, taking place again. Of course, American Samoa is beginning to really take a, a hit every time something happens globally. So we have become susceptible to global forces in the, in the in economy. So it didn't used to be that way, but now it's everything that happens in Europe or America, it's, it's hitting us as well. Every time they seem to slide into a recession, we slide into a kind of a recession here ourselves. And you know, it's hard to explain, and, but you know, these are the patterns that we see. Two patterns that I'm pursuing, and first and foremost, is what we are doing with relations to the NEG uh, grants. And uh, that is in the area of contact centers. When I sought to bring the fiber optic uh, to the territory and partnered up uh, with uh, uh, Alandia to, to do that, whereby we bought one-third of the company that owns the, the, the cable through the assistance of the federal government and some local funding. We were actually trying to bring the cable for purposes of standing up call centers. But as we complete that project, we also came to learn that call centers are very difficult to sustain. And we just could not quite get it off the ground. So we've never abandoned the idea. We continue to look around and Evelyn Langford, you know, the uh, governor's authorized representatives for uh, emergency management and recovery, uh, brought to me this company that helps develop contact centers. It's a slightly, it's along the same lines, but slightly different uh, concept 
but again, it depends on the speed of communication. So my philosophy of embracing information technology as our next level of developments has, we've never abandoned that, and continues to be the area that I see will have further developments you know, in the future. And again, the level of employment that comes with that development is going to have to be a much better trained workforce. So that's what we're working on, improving the educational you know, aspects, continue to work with our community college to develop that competent workforce, and at the same time work with these partners to, to develop these con, uh, concepts. And I think that I really like the concept that they brought, that you know, the, the, the industry and the businesses are very scalable. So you can start with a five, you know, five telephones or 500 telephones. Depends on your ability, your funding, and what you can contract and the businesses that comes your way. I see that happening. And I see a lot of new jobs coming, you know, along that area. And that's why I support the efforts of Ms. Langford in developing this. It's unavoidable. Um, we are a member of this community. We are a member of Oceania. It makes all the sense to do all that we can to belong to, to that region. And the region is also beginning to research in, uh, in trade and uh, collaboration, uh, not only on social issues, but also on development issues. So American Samoa needs to take its own seat in that, uh, in that circle. We can't just be the, the outsider to our own Polynesian groups, to our own uh, Oceania region. And that's what's happening in IC. This was the reason I drove to at least allow the State Department to permit us to become an associate member of the Pacific Islands Forum because this is where the discussion is happening. This is what I talked about earlier. Our political status as it is today is not going to be sustainable in the future and I have started the dialogue to talk about political status and we need to continue that you know uh, unfortunately I cannot predict what future governors will do but I hope that I will continue to do all I can to uh, highlight you know the, the, the need to do this because the trade amongst us is very viable. It's just that transportation is an issue, uh, the political status is, uh, is an issue, and so we need to address these along with the, with the region. You know, we cannot avoid it. Yeah. I am promoting the idea of, of a freely affiliated state with the United States of America. It's not a new concept, but uh, there are some things that I would like to improve on and I see some improvement from other relationships that the United States have forged with some of these Pacific countries, especially the Northern Pacific Micronesian countries. Uh, there are very good uh, models out there that we can improve upon and be self-governing uh, under our own label and not lose the association you know, with the United States, which is critical and extremely important. Our people are very loyal to the United States. Our young people and our, many of the fathers and mothers have served in the armed forces, and uh, I would not do anything to diminish their loyalty to the United States, but they need to understand that self-governance you know, is also very important for the future of, of the country. But I would not dream of, you know, severing the cord, you know, with, uh, with the United States. We, whatever we do, we have to frame it around a continuing relationship with the United States that is close, uh, it's real, it's, uh, uh, it's collaborative, and, and I think we can sustain ourselves much better 
you know, in any future economic, you know, uh, conditions, because we cannot just rely on the United States. The United States itself is coming under so much pressure, and every time they cut funding, we suffer. Because when they terminate a program, we terminate all the workers that work in that program. It, 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 you cannot, you just cannot rely on these social programs to sustain an economy. It's not the way to build an economy. It's good for the moment, but sustainability is very, very uh, minimal. In the last political status study, I asked them to really give some time to the Palau model. What Palau has achieved with the United States is the free access to the United States that they come in with a Palau passport and as I understand it, they don't need a visa. They just show their Palau passport and they go into the United States. They want to work, they show their Palau passport and they have a green card to, you know, to work. Not that they get an actual green card, but a Palau citizen has free access to the U.S., very much like what we have as U.S. nationals. We don't have a passport, we get a U.S. passport, but we also have what they call a certificate of identity that you can access the, you know, the United States and be able to work anywhere as long as you can show a birth certificate that you were born on the soils of American Samoa and uh, you can go work any place else without a, the necessity of a green card. Those are the kinds of things that I believe we can negotiate successfully with the United States because we're not just a foreign country right now. We are living under the United States system. So it's not difficult to transition those things into a successful relationship along those lines. The opportunities that were presented through this relationship with Guam is also through the good relationships of the, us as leaders, that we share what we're doing in each uh, of our respective territories. And I have promoted that relationship the same way I promote football, rugby, the military, and when this opportunity offered itself, I also shared with the governor of Guam the fact that we have a facility here for training firemen and emergency responders. So that's kind of uh, what prompted the discussions. They have built this facility, this training facility. There's no need for me to, to build my own because it's more cost effective to send our people there, get trained. If they get employment through the build up, I'd be ecstatic. And I hope that all 30 of, 32 of them get employed, you know, through that way. But whatever they will be able to take, it will be an employment that we would not have here. And that will be one less person. I have to worry about a job for that person. So that creates, you know, mutual cooperation amongst us as territories. And I hope that we can share the same vision with states that, but it's difficult. It's very difficult because states operate on a totally different level. So uh, when we started talking about those things, I was reminded of how we have been pushing the military option. The military provides jobs, and provides education, the extension of educational uh, assistance to young people who choose to go their, their route. And we, I would say uh, that we have been very successful in promoting uh, that as well. Uh, because once they go into the military, we try to explain to them, look, it's an opportunity that will give you a gateway to other things. Serve your country well, but don't ever forget that if you have a chance to go to school, go to school. Finish your degrees. Because if you finish your degrees in the military, chances are you're going to get promoted, you're going to, have, you're going to retire with very high ranks, and it will help your families in the future. So don't lose your vision of education. 
It's the same way with sports. You know, it's, uh, we don't have money to send a lot of our children to, to, to college and universities. But there are other opportunities that are available through their abilities to, to, to play. So we promote the sports angle to push them to gain those opportunities through soccer, volleyball, now baseball, softball, football. We are more successful in football than anything else, but we're just now beginning to tap the other areas as well. Again, this is what we promote. Play as hard as you can, serve your schools well, but don't lose your, your schooling. Make sure you graduate, that at the end of the day, your playing stops, but your degree will take you further. So the same thing with the military, you stop somewhere. I have started the um, development towards making my two-year community college into a four-year institution. It makes sense for us to have a four-year institution here for the bigger bulk of the students that will not be able to afford going off to the United States for schooling. And second to that, my fear is, although the goals might be honorable, that you leave here to go to school, that is, is too much of a temptation to get away from your parents and get to live with people that you have not lived with, you know, for a long time, and things can easily get changed, and you know, the the, the main goal is lost. So school becomes a secondary need. A job is more important for the moment, and before you know it, you're, you're they're hooked up with other children, and they lose their ways too fast, too easy. So the answer to that, in my estimation, is create our own four-year institution. Earn your four-year degree here. Give them maturity so that when they leave the territory, even if they want to leave after that point, they leave with a degree. They have a little better chance at better opportunities. They are a little bit more mature. They don't have to rely on relatives or friends, and they are probably, you know, uh, mature in their decisions as well. They will make it difficult to get hooked up with temptations that tends to uh, divert the younger, you know, younger minds. So it, it's it's a way of trying to to address social issues as well as enhancing the value of education that you, st you can still get here in American Samoa. So this is what I've been trying to do. I'm hoping to graduate the first four-year degree in education here. NEG is one of those lifelines that uh, we did not contemplate. But when the introduction was made, we, at that time, were kind of grabbing at anything that, you know, tends to have some indication of hope. And NEG was one of those when it was brought to my attention. So I just simply said to them, go after it. See what you can, you can do. You know, if you can handle it from the angle of the displaced workers at the canneries, if, if there's help directly for recovery, whatever you can get, you know, do it. So Evelyn and her staff went after that, and uh, I frankly was very surprised when they came back. Of course, a little bit of help came from some uh, consultants that I use in Washington, D.C., uh, that has very close relationships with uh, uh, federal agencies that helped uh, in, in pushing the agenda for that. Uh, Senator Inouye was very critical in that. Our own congressman uh, made some calls, and uh, to my surprise, we were granted 24 million. I was looking for maybe four or five million, but when I was told 24 million, I just about fell off my seat. I couldn't believe it. Uh, but. 
I was not the one that was going to say, you know, what's going on? I just said, make it work. So we did, and uh, they offered the assistance to people who were out of work, uh, making sure that uh, we followed all the guidelines of the grant and give as many jobs as possible. Uh, and I know that I think about 2,000 or a little over that were people were able to come back to work the same week that they were terminated from other jobs. So that's the lifeline that was thrown our way and helped us survive the, Im the immediate impact of, of the uh, earthquake and the, and the tsunami. But as it turned out, it's become the lifeline that is now pulling us ahead towards building a more resilient community. And that's a benefit that, you know, uh, I think I have to give full credit to Ms. Langford for what she had done because of working so closely and uh, in, in, in with the U.S. Department of Labor has permitted our Department of Human and, uh, Resources to, uh, to come up with these other greater programs, including the contact center that I was talking about. Was avoiding the second tsunami, the economic tsunami of joblessness. Because if I had to address the 1,200 jobs that just came to a halt the day after, I wouldn't have been able to do that. I wouldn't have been able to take care of those families in the middle of this recovery effort. That would have been much more devastating to families, villages, and everybody else down the line. Because of the NEG, we avoided that second tsunami that could have resulted if it weren't for that help. And when we put people back to work, even though they knew it was temporary work uh, for the recovery from the effects of the tsunami, they were able to take care of their families and we didn't have to worry about what else would happen because we couldn't take care of them at the same time. So that was the one single most important thing that NEG had done for us, you know, in, in the middle of all the other assistance that they were able to, to do uh, for the recovery. In my estimation, it would have been worse because there would have been people walking around without jobs, couldn't feed themselves, and we couldn't help them because we were not in any shape at all to even offer any assistance. So this was the only way they were able to get ahead, stabilize their families from the losses of their jobs, and even give, gave new families new hope, temporary as it was. We were able to, to take care of them too and not have to worry about what, what would happen because our resources had just been uh, drawn to practically nothing. Absolutely, I met with uh, many of them one-on-one, -on -one, ask them how they are, how, you know, how do they feel about their jobs. They were just so ecstatic. I've had a few moments where you know, their, their pays were delayed a little bit, uh, somewhere down the line when the drawdown on funds was a little slower. And uh, so <clears throat> uh, there were some anxious moments, but not of any real material nature, but you know, just basically processing errors and, and delays. So, but all of them will all say the same thing. Thank you for the job. No more, no less. That was the first and foremost things in their mind. Thank you for the job. I don't think that legacy is going to be mine. I think the legacy belongs to the people because the bridges they built as a result of this disaster has been phenomenal. Uh, the partnerships, I have never seen a better partnership between the federal agencies, FEMA, and our local agencies. I've never seen better cooperation between the military and FEMA and our local agency. So the bridges that they've built uh, are going to last for a long time. Even after the tsunami, American, uh, let's say, the Corps of Engineers uh, conducted a study 
that is now you know, serving as the basic for rebuilding resilience in the community. That's you know, uh, assistance that it never came our way before. So I think the legacy of the people in this is that is their ability to build these uh, bridges between all these agencies and amongst themselves to collaborate as VOAD, you know, standing it up as a uh, nonprofit organization that uh, transcends all boundaries, churches, politics, village governance, and everything. Uh, you, you couldn't ask for any better uh, working together you know, than any other time. I've never seen it. I've been here for 16 years. I've worked with uh, previous disasters, <clears throat> and I've never seen better uh, communication cooperation, collaboration, and I'm in support for one another. So I think that's the legacy of the community. I think the lessons learned are very enduring and will serve uh, the community well, and I'm seeing that happening. You know, after the, the, the disaster, there's a different level of, uh, of that cooperation happening not only between the village and villages and, uh, and the government, but also between government agencies themselves. My greatest hope for American Samoa is that we remain a God-fearing country and we continue to uh, work on securing you know, a political status that will uh, sustain itself uh, in the future for our younger generation. I think you're going to find uh, American Samoa in a much better place, much more vibrant, uh, economically uh, better. Uh, with all the developments that are now in place, will come to fruition beginning probably in about three to four years. And then after that, it will continue to grow. So 10 years from today, it will be a totally different American Samoa than you've seen today.